I decided to pick up a book that I used in uh, leading a small men's group that we have at the house. Um, we just finished this book. It's J.D. Greer, if you've ever heard of him. He's a pastor out of North Carolina on the radio, uh, several books. Um, but the title of the book is, What Are You Going to Do With Your Life? And um, some of the chapters get a little pushy, uh, toe stomping. Um, and as a matter of fact, one of the fellows after one chapter said, can't we just burn this book and do something easy like Habakkuk or something like that? So um, it, it, it does present a challenge, okay? And we're just going to read through one of the chapters today. There are some questions. Um, there's some scripture in the, the body of what we'll read, but um, I have verified before I taught it the first time with the guys, uh, the scripture is verbatim from true scripture uh, that's printed in here, but we'll have the reference if you do want to look it up for yourself in your, your own Bible. Um, but I do have a couple of questions that I always try to ask before we get started on a lesson. First off, who are the ministers at Church at the Center? All of us. Good class. You've evidently been taught well, yes. Because so often people pigeonhole and would say, Pastor Tim, JW, Pam. Um, but nope, every one of us is a minister. And um, matter of fact, there's a quote here at the beginning of a chapter that I want to try to find. Um, okay. I, I told Rebecca I left this book out on the back enclosed deck at our house with the windows open and it rained. So my book kind of looks like it got ran over. So some of the pages like to stick together, but <clears throat> there's a fellow named Carl Henry that uh, made this statement, and the truth is just so real. The gospel is only good news if it gets there in time. Isn't that powerful? So we talked about who we are. We're ministers, okay? But why do we study? I'm looking for two particular things. Why should we study? The Bible says to be approved. To be approved? Okay. Um, expand on that just a little bit. Timothy tells Timothy. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. So that you will know the truth. There we go. So that we'll know the truth. Mm hmm. Exactly. Barb? We can't stop reading because it has different meanings to us as we mature into this. Book. Oh, how true. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I read that passage ten times and it didn't mean that then. <laughs> yep. Because it adapts to our life. Uh, see. My, in Hosea, I believe, says, my people will perish without knowledge. Mm-hmm. How true. Okay, so we know we study to increase our understanding. There's one other thought that I'm looking for. Matthew 24, Jesus tells us to share his word. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And we can't share it if we don't know it. Exactly. We study so that we know what's going on. And we study so that when coincidences happen where somebody comes up to us or we meet somebody that's going through a difficult time, we'll be able to share the good news. Because the gospel is only good news if it gets there on time, right? <laughs> so um, with that kind of as our, our basis, okay? I'm, I'm just going to read. Now again, anybody who wants to uh, stop me, 
ask a question, make a comment, do so. That's all right. I'm trying to do this without my glasses. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's not the critic that counts. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, who spends himself for a worthy cause, who, at the best, knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who, at the worst, if he fails, at least fails daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. In other words, those who did nothing. Uh, that's by Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> Have you ever seen cardboard ministries? Basically, to a backdrop of a worship song usually, people walk across the stage holding a piece of cardboard. On one side is a one-sentence description of their life before Christ. Something like, broken and alone, in bondage to the opinions of others, a self-hater. But after a moment, they flip their cardboard over, revealing a one-sentence description of their life after Christ. Rescued and recommissioned. Set free. Beloved daughter. The best one I've ever seen was a woman whose front side read, diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. She was joined by an older man on stage who held up his sign, doctor who diagnosed her, an atheist. Then he flipped over his sign which read, through her joy, in this suffering, I came to know Christ. Then she flipped her sign over, and it just said, worth it. I really want to be able to say those words at the end of my life. Ask yourself the, the uglies in life, the bumps, the diagnoses, the financial crises. Do we say it's worth it if somebody else can benefit? Sometimes it takes us a couple of moments to, to think of it from that angle. But this gal thought it was worth it to go through all of that she did so that her doctor could find Christ. We admire, even envy, the athlete who suffers through seamless, endless hours of training to master his game. I always loved the moment at Rocky Balboa movies where Rocky endured whatever brutal training his coach laid out for him so that he could face whatever mammoth of a man awaited him in the ring. It was inspiring to watch him try to run through two feet of snow, do sit-ups off the loft of a barn, and chase chickens, because you knew the moment would come when he would step into the ring, chisel up like a Greek god. And when they played the Rocky theme song and he dropped his robe, you knew that every moment of agonizing training was worth it. We admire the discipline of the student who labors into the wee hours of the night to get his degree, or the Navy SEAL who endures the incomprehensible moments of Hell Week to become one of our country's elite warriors. We praise the devotion of the single mother who tirelessly works two jobs just to get her kids through school. We know that painful as their journeys may be, there will come a time when each of these crosses the finish line collapses in triumph and says, it was worth it. Imagine being able to live in a sense of purpose so compelling that even your darkest days of struggle brim with that hope. Confident that the day will come when you look back over every difficult circumstance, every dark chapter, and you're able to say, it was worth it. There's a young mother in his church, J.D. Greer's, whom I'll call Kristen. 
who last year went in for a routine eye exam when she received devastating news. The doctor told her that she had developed a degenerative and incurable condition that would take her sight in less than five years. She had no idea anything was even wrong. Kristen's in her mid-30s. She has four children, two biological and two adopted. If things go as the doctors predict, she'll never see them graduate. Just a couple of weeks before the doctor visit, Kristen had asked God to guide her to a theme verse for the year. God had led her to 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Therefore do not give up. Even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. That's 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Kristen had written in her journal, God help me to trust in things not seen. Help me to fix my eyes, my thoughts, my affection, not on the temporary, but on the eternal. I want a faith that depends on you at every turn and eyes that are focused on you. Here's what she shared with Pastor Greer. As I listened to the news, the diagnosis, I heard in my heart God speak, over, speak the truth over me. So we do not focus on what is seen, but what is unseen. And what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. This is not an affliction that God has done to me, but something he's entrusted to my stewardship. I was reminded of Jesus' words to his disciples when they came across a blind man. This has come to pass so that the work of God could be displayed. God has shown me more of him in the midst of this suffering. This is still the, the woman that's going through this diagnosis, okay? God has shown me more of him in the midst of this suffering. Looking back on that prayer from January 2019, I realize now that God is preparing me to hear this news. Already God has used this diagnosis to help me fix my eyes on him, to help me to depend on him, to grow my spiritual sight. Jesus is far sweeter and more valuable in suffering than when I think I can do it on my own. And as painful as it's been, I'm learning what it means that my spiritual sight is far more valuable than my physical sight. I don't bank my hope on any healing from my coming blindness, as there is none. I bank my hope on the suffering Savior, Jesus Christ who is far more precious than sight, or my ability to drive, or walk independently, or see my four children's faces. These things are inconsequential in light of eternity. I wrote in the margin of the book, could I think this? I think that would really take some deep soul searching to be able to see the benefit of a situation like that. Um, this, this woman must have truly been given a gift of extra strength um, to get through this. <clears throat> well, shortly after my diagnosis, I was praying when I saw a vision in my mind. Jesus was leading me, blindfolded, into the midst of the most beautiful landscape I had ever seen. Once I got to an overlook, Jesus took my blindfold off. In that moment, I realized God was showing me that I can trust my good Father, even with a blindfold in His hands. I can give up my sight for a short time here on earth, because I trust my Father knows what's best for me, always working for my good and for His glory. 
Because what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is eternal. It's worth it. Worth it's the conviction that inflamed the first Christian martyrs, uh, especially Stephen. Stephen had been hauled into court to give an account of his actions, and because of his sacrificial service to poor widows, many Jewish priests were turning to faith in Christ. There became, or there before the angry Sanhedrin, that's the guys that thought they really knew it all, um, he explained that everything he did, he did as an act of worship to Christ. And then, this is Acts 7, 54 through 60. When they, the religious leaders, heard these things, they were enraged and, and gnashed their teeth at him. Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven. He saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. They yelled at the top of their voices covering their ears, and together rushed against him. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. As the witnesses laid their garments at the feet of the young man named Saul, while they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And after saying this, he died. Acts 7, 54 through 60. What's most peculiar about Stephen's vision is that he sees Jesus standing. Everywhere else you see Jesus is at the right hand of God. He is sitting. It's actually an important theological symbol. Jesus being seated indicates the work of salvation is done. I just lost my place. <laughs> Probably should put my glasses on, but that'd really be pushing it. Okay. <laughs> there we go. So why would Jesus be there standing? I think there's only one possible explanation. He's standing to honor his son and receive him home. The world just labeled Stephen a traitor. And they're throwing baseball-sized stones at him to prove it. Jesus, it's almost like he can't help it, stands to his feet and says, No, he's my son. They jeered. Your life's a waste. And Jesus responded, Well done, good and faithful servant. And Stephen, face beaming with angelic brightness, felt one overpowering conviction rise up in his heart. It was worth it. Only a vision like this one of Jesus standing by the throne to receive you home can give you the power to go the distance. Sometimes in church we talk about Jesus as the missing piece in our lives, our guide, our help in time of trouble, and he is all of those things. But the only thing that will compel the kind of obedience we see in Stephen is a vision of Jesus standing alone or at the end, victorious over it all. You have to decide if knowing him and being motivated by him and received by him is by itself worth it. You are, if you really serious about following Jesus, at some point, obedience to him is going to take you 180 degrees opposite the direction you think you want to go. In that moment, you have to decide if obedience to him is worth it. Has anybody been kind of sidetracked by this is my plan? And all of a sudden, you find that your plan is out the window and his is different? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll, I'll just interject a little bit of story from me because that's one I know the best. Um, <clears throat> some of you might remember that I used to sing a lot. Played the organ for church for years. Um, yeah, 
And um, I always thought music was my only ministry. Okay? And then, and Pam and I were just talking about this a few seconds ago, um, the, the pastor at the time said, Tom, would you mind teaching the adult Sunday school class at Winona Friends just for a quarter? Just for a quarter. <clears throat> and a friend of mine pointed out not too awful long ago that it turned out to be a quarter of a century. Um, <laughs> because after 27 years of expecting the quarter to be over any time, <laughs> I hung it up and let somebody else step into that role. But me, teach in a class? No way. No way. I sing. I play the organ. I occasionally play the piano. But teach? No. No, but God had a different idea. And the teaching led to such a, a wonderful benefit for me in my life in the fact that uh, then I started a men's group on Wednesday evenings. And, you know, just a small church, but ended up 30 guys came on Wednesday nights. To, now, I'm, I'm not polishing my halo. I didn't have anything to do with it. But if I had said no when Pastor Steve asked me to teach for a quarter, I doubt that I ever would have gone ahead and done that. And now I have the privilege of leading a small men's group. And guess who gets the most benefit out of those? Me. Mm -hmm. So... When you feel God telling you, uh -uh, turn around the opposite direction because I want you to go over here. Really pay attention to that. Pray about it. <laughs> and if you're like me, you know, get your claws out and stick them at, no, I'm going over here <laughs> for a while. But it's worth it. It's worth it. Sorry to sidetrack there, but... Anybody else have something they'd like to share with the group? No, we have a nursing home in this group. And before COVID, over at Brookdale, Brian would come and, and we'd have that whole area where the fireplace is filled with the people that lived there. Mm -hmm. And now we're lucky that we have five. But you know who benefits the most from that? Me and Jim and Charlotte. Because we get to go there and tell them about our Jesus and what he did. And it's like, ha, ha, you can't explain what you get. Mm -hmm. you get How true. Thanks for doing that, Ellie. Mm So who's going to be waiting around the throne to receive you home? Our families are precious. Our friends are a blessing. Our dreams are important. But none of those things will be waiting for us around the throne. And thus, none are worthy of the offering of our lives. Only Jesus is. Now, that doesn't mean we won't see those folks or their spirits intermix with ours. We, we don't have a direct answer of how that all happens. But our prim primary benefit of eternal life in heaven with Him is with Him. <laughs> Jesus will be there to greet us. Claire was a young woman who moved to a remote part of Central Asia to work alongside one of our mission teams there. And for five years, she served the poorest of the poor. Better look at the time here. Okay. Late one night in January 2008, Claire was kidnapped by Muslim extremists. They perceived her presence there as a threat. She brought education to women who they believed should not learn skills outside the home. And she was a Christian on top of that. Clara had left a very comfortable life in the American Southeast to live in a place where dust storms were a daily occurrence, 
where windows required blast film because of the constant risk of bomb explosions, where sometimes there's no electricity, to run even a fan in the midst of 100 degree heat, where she had only sporadic inter internet service to get news from home, and where an armed Islamic group that is hostile to the gospel operates with impunity. Clara did all of this because she understood that Christ had come to earth to face even greater dangers for her. She did it joyfully. Our team leader negotiated with the hostage takers for six months. They kept moving her from location to location. United States Special Forces tried several rescue attempts and twice they got very close. On one occasion, it was reported she was rushed into a neighboring house just before the troops arrived. On another, she was hidden in the floorboards of the house that the troops were searching. I can only imagine what Clara must have felt to hear her rescuers just a few feet away, unable to get their attention. And when news of her kidnapping was heard in the streets, women from the southern stronghold of these Islamic extremists were outraged. Something unheard had happened. 300 women marched to the governor's mansion to demand that he do something to free her. These women had benefited from Clara's projects. They didn't fully understand the gospel yet, but they'd seen Christ in Clara. I wish I could say there was a happy ending to this story, but we don't ultimately know what happened to Clara. She kept being moved from village to village, handed off from one group of rogue Islamists to another. The last we heard, she had been taken by a nomadic group of armed smugglers across the Central Asian desert. And then the tra trail went cold. We don't know for sure if she was killed. The kidnappers said they were going to kill her because she was a Christian. And at this point, we have to conclude that they carried through with their threat. Still, we have no proof and no body. I asked our team leader who led in the negotiations if Claire was an extraordinary hero of faith. And he replied, well, in a sense, now that we see what she was, now that we see that she was. But when I talked to her, I remember a regular girl from the American South, a smiling friend, a person who struggled like the rest of us. A girl who loved to go on vacation, a girl who didn't like it when it was really hot, a regular American girl who decided to step out in faith and obey a calling from Jesus to go to a place she wasn't even sure she could handle. I saw God's grace and strength enable Clara to set up an amazing project here in Central Asia. It's a grace that got the attention of the community, and I'm sure that same grace and strength were with her when she was taken by the Muslim extremists. Then he paused, thought for a moment, and said, faith is demonstrated in times of adversity, but its reality is manifested long before that. Sometimes faith is quiet, working humbly in love, but that's the same faith that makes a regular girl like Clara stand up to one of history's most vicious regimes and say, no, Christ is better. You can take my life, but you can't take him. His mission will outlive all of you and me. It was worth it to Clara. If you live a life of radical obe obedience, not everyone's going to praise you. Many whom you love and trust will question your motives but because you threaten the status quo, you should be prepared to deal with opposition from places you never expected it from. From friends. From some, even from your parents. Religious leaders. Some will act like in obeying him, you're betraying them. That's why you have to keep your eyes fixed firmly on the one who's beside the throne the one standing there ready to receive you home. Because his standing ovation outweighs their scorn. He's worth it. In 1904, William Borden graduated from high school. He was the heir to the Borden family fortune. 
At the time, the Borden Milk Company was one of the most profitable businesses in the United States, which would have made young William one of the richest men in the country. Upon graduation, his parents gave him a luxurious graduation gift, a trip around the globe. But something happened on that trip. His parents weren't anticipating it, but Borden became overwhelmed by the world's lostness. He couldn't get over the masses of people with no chance of hearing the gospel. Borden was a new believer, and he wanted to do something about it. William told his father he didn't want to take on the family business. He wanted to be a missionary. His parents were furious, but William told them that he would divert any inheritance that he did receive into the mission. Some of William's Christian friends even told him, you're throwing everything away. You're wasting your life. But Borden wouldn't be dissuaded. After graduating from the University of Yale and then Princeton Seminary, he climbed aboard a boat headed for China. But because Borden intended to work with Muslims in China, he stopped in Egypt to spend time learning Arabic. Always helps be able to speak their language, right? Mm -hmm. And one month after arriving in Egypt, he contracted spinal meningitis and died. He was 25 years old. Back in the United States, headlines proclaimed the tragic news. The stories echoed the advice Borden's friends and family had given him. What a waste of a life. But Borden didn't think so. As the story goes, while on his deathbed, someone asked if he had any final words. He pulled out his Bible, turned to a blank page at the back, and wrote, No regrets. From the perspective of the world, Borden's life was wasted. From the perspective of eternity, it wasn't. His was not a wasted life, but a worthy one. William Borden is buried in a small cemetery in Cairo. Cemetery so far out of the way that you don't know what, if, if you don't know what you're looking for, you'll never find it. His tombstone is bunched up among many others. And the writing on it is so faint you can barely read it. But if you get down real close, you can make out a single sentence. Apart from faith in Christ, there's no explanation for such a life. Apart from faith in Christ, there is no explanation for such a life. So will that be true of your life? your life, and your life. You're late, Corey. Yes, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll forgive you. <laughs> what are you going to do with your life? Are you going to use it in a way that only makes sense if eternity is real and the gospel is true? Does that make us stop and evaluate? We have to make up our minds. If Christ is risen, then nothing invested into his kingdom is ever wasted. If he's risen, everything we invest anywhere else is wasted. Do you believe this? Only one life to live will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. We've all heard that for many years, but boy, the truth is still there. Will you adopt this as your personal credo? If you do, then live in such a way that one day, he, that, wait a minute, let me start that one over again, okay? If you do adopt this as your personal credo, then live in such a way that it will, one day, be said of you, apart from faith in Christ, is there no explanation of such a life? Because only a life lived like that will you be able to say in the end, it was worth it. Any thoughts?
Um, so, true or false? When we start taking our social security, our work is done. False. False? False. False. Okay. Just begin. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> but true. True. Our you know, my my dear wife, right there behind Bob, because I'm I'm just in that stage, I sold the business and all that sort of stuff, so I'm Retired, so I'm only working one day a week, and um, you know I'll do tax season. But um, yeah, my dear wife has always said to me, Tom, the word retirement is not in scripture. Thank you, dear. Thank you, dear. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Uh huh. And in reality, sometimes these are the days when maybe we have a little more time, a little more freedom. Not that if we are still in the workforce, people should still know by our actions, our faith, our love, that there's something different about us. Okay? But, I, okay, I'll fess up. I always said during that one quarter that I was teaching Sunday school, um, Lord, whatever you want me to do, except I don't want to go to Zimbabwe. Just, you know, make sure that wherever you send me, there's at least a three-star hotel and good restaurants. Okay. Um, and fast forward, um, I, I had stepped in as associate pastor at Winona Friends for a while just because we needed somebody and I was still running my business, etc. Well, then it got to the point we had to hire a full-time fella and Dan Hepner came, wonderful, exactly the person that God wanted in that spot. And wouldn't you know it, his father leads a ministry in Zimbabwe. <laughs> and he wants Dan to take over. And Dan wants me to go to Zimbabwe with him. And I'm thinking, Lord, this is really not humorous. You know, this is... <laughs> We'll, we'll leave that in God's hands. But <laughs> um, point is, we never quite know what God might have in store. For you, for you, for me. Rebecca's a little on the questionable side. You know, we, we don't know what he's got planned. That is true. Um, I was going to say to that, sometimes... When I get really, really tired of what I'm doing, I have to remind myself, and I'm speaking of the children's ministry, and I love the children dearly, but when I get exhausted in my own flesh, mm -hmm. I, I look at one lady in particular that volunteers one time a month, and a lot of you know her. She's in her 90s. Her name is Laurel Todd. <laughs> Laurel Todd is epic. Yes, not? yes, yes. She is, yes. she is going to be one of those people where God will be, the Lord will be standing when she enters heaven. Mm -hmm. She is going to be one of those people. So when I get frustrated or I get tired or I get grumpy or I just get plain whiny, <gasps> right? Mm -hmm. I think of Laurel and I'm like, dang, that <laughs> woman comes in once a month. And I said, you want to sit down? Do you want a chair? And she's like a hummingbird. No. She does not sit down. <laughs> Aaron Todd's grandma. She doesn't sit down. She is unbelievable. So she is like my, my hero on earth uh -huh. with children. With children. Yep. But then I realized I'm not doing it for anybody that's here. I'm doing it for Jesus. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it yes. for him. Yes. So I need to get over myself once in a while, right? Mm-hmm. And just move forward with my quarter. But what a wonderful example of reality Rebecca just gave us. Okay, Because even when we know God's called us to do something, mm -hmm. sometimes we as humans grumble. Oh, yeah. And fight. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to do this. I'm tired. Mm -hmm. 
but I want to do this instead. Lord, please, I really don't want to go to Zimbabwe. But, <laughs> well, no, no, no. Not yet, Ellie. Not yet. <laughs> Your quarter's not done. No, evidently not. So, any other thoughts before we close up? Well, again, um, I, I hope we could gather something small out of this, this time together. It's not the study that I know Pastor Tim gives you and that uh, Pastor Chris had always given, but um, we, uh, we just need, a, or I need a reminder sometimes of the fact that Tom's not in control, even though I'd really like to be sometimes. Pam will vouch for that, but. <clears throat> I refuse to answer that question, Ellie. <laughs> I plead the fifth, okay? <laughs> After 44 years, I want to make it to 45, okay? <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Rebecca's in trouble. Oh, okay. Well, we're going to close in prayer after. Yes. Yes, it it truly is. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, what are you going to do with your life? J D Greer. That's G R E E A R. G R E E A R. Okay. Uh, Christian Book Distributors has it. I would imagine Amazon has it. Um, but, um, you know, wear your seal-toed shoes when, when you're reading the rest of the book. Okay. But it's definitely well worth. Yeah, it wasn't expensive. It, it's just a... Just don't put it in the rain. Pardon? Just don't get it in the rain. No. Yeah. No, it's just... Of course, I have several other copies because I tend to like to have books to, to give away, but that's my copy and it's got my notes and things in it. So let's pray. Father God, how we thank you that you choose to use us, just plain old human beings, to be your hands and feet here. Help us be willing to be used. Help us to see when you're leading us. Give us the strength, the courage to, to follow, even when our dreams and our thoughts don't exactly line up with yours. But help us to have that overall vision of life here is short. Eternity is real. Eternity is where we will spend with you. And we want, Father, to, to bring people with us we want to share the gospel in a timely manner with those around us so that they can join us when eternity comes. Thank you again for your love. Uh, pray for Pastor Tim as he flies home. Uh, pray, Father, that you would just uh, go before us for the, the balance of the service that's going to start here soon. Thank you again for your love and for our salvation. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.